Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much for coming. I think it's for all of us who are interested, concerned about Afghanistan, an interesting time. We're making a transition where we have no clear image of where we're going, how the next administration is going to deal with the issues in Afghanistan. There are major uncertainties in what is happening within the Afghan government, whereas the Special Inspector General for Afghan Reconstruction is going to point out, there are many critical areas of concern. I'm not going to uh, give John a long introduction. Looking around, I think most of you are well aware of what the Special Inspector General for Afghan Reconstruction does. I would say that if there are lessons to be learned from counterinsurgency and from this kind of campaign, one of them is the need to have an independent voice, to take a hard look at how effective our programs are, how well run they are, how well integrated they are, and how well we can work with a host country government. Thinking back to my own experience from Vietnam onwards, I've always been struck by the fact that our natural tendency is to focus on the threat. But in the real world, in dealing with counterinsurgency, the problems we almost inevitably have ourselves in adapting to a given war as Americans in creating an integrated, meaningful civil military approach present almost as many problems as the threat does. And in every case I can think of, the host country government has presented at least as many problems in practice as the threat does. And that's almost predictable because why do you have a serious insurgency? Because the host country government has failed politically, security, or in organization. And having this outside voice has been absolutely critical. And with that, let me let John take over and I think outline some of the issues which are going to be absolutely critical if we're to move forward in Afghanistan. John? Thank you very much, uh, Tony, for those kind words uh, and for the introduction and for basically all the work you've done on Afghanistan and on our nation's security. Uh, I also want to thank uh, my old colleague uh, John Hamry uh, of CSIS and most importantly all of you uh, for taking the time out of your busy schedules to attend today's release of our high-risk report, which I think we have some copies of the paper version it's available also on our website. And uh, for the second time, and I think it's the first time an IG has done it, we actually also have it uh, in a usable, for for usable fashion on your uh, uh, phones and uh, other electronic instruments, most of which I don't know how to work and use, but I know the younger generation does. Uh, on Friday, January 20th, President-elect Trump will be sworn into office as the next President of the United States. Any inauguration day is remarkable and historic, and this one will be no different. But in Afghanistan, it will simply be another Friday. Another Friday where more than 8,400 U.S. servicemen and women will be working to train, advise, and assist the Afghan National Defense Forces. 
Another Friday where thousands of our diplomatic personnel and contractors will be supporting our mission in Afghanistan. Another Friday where the Afghan security forces will struggle to fight off at a strong insurgency and supply and equip their troops. Another Friday where unfortunately corruption will be widespread and where many Afghans will turn to the Taliban for justice and protection from the avarice of the corrupt officials of their own government. Another Friday where the U.S. and its allies will pay the salaries of Afghan police, soldiers, teachers, doctors, and civil servants who do not exist. Another Friday where Afghan and coalition personnel alike will face threats from the terrorist operatives, operatives in Afghanistan. Another Friday where the U.S. will spend approximately $13 million per day on attempting to get the Afghan government to stand on its own two feet. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have been reconstructing Afghanistan since 2002. To date, more than $115 billion of U.S. taxpayer money has been sent, spent, sometimes wisely, too often not. Another $7.5 billion have been appropriated, but not yet spent. It's in the pipeline. And international donors have pledged to provide financial support to, the Af to, Af to Afghanistan, its security forces, and its civilian government through 2020. The United States is estimating for us alone, it'll be five to six billion dollars a year through 2020. In 2014, SIGAR issued its first high-risk report for the incoming Congress identifying areas we felt the Congress should pay special attention to when evaluating the reconstruction efforts in Afghanistan. Now that two years have passed, we felt it was important to update that list to help inform the new Congress and the new Trump administration of the most pressing reconstruction challenges in 2017 and beyond. As such, or as much as I should say, I wish I could say a lot has improved in Afghanistan over those two years. I cannot. Although there has been some successes, which I will highlight today, a lot more still needs to be done. So the high risk list we release today outlines eight key areas where more needs to be done and which are the biggest threats to our Afghan mission in Afghanistan. They are the capacity and capabilities of the Afghan security forces, corruption in the rule of law, sustainability, on budget assistance, counter narcotics, contract management, oversight in general, and planning and strategy. Now while all eight high-risk areas represent matters that could fatally undermine the reconstruction mission in Afghanistan, I want to focus today on a criti critical nexus between Afghan security issues, corruption, counter-narcotics, on-budget assistance, and sustainability. But before I do anything, let me start with the good news, the positive news. Compared to two years ago, when we released our first high-risk report, we now have an encouraging track record with President Ghani and Chief Executive Abdullah that demonstrate their commitment to do the right thing for their country. Both have been very cooperative with the U.S. government, as well as SIGAR's own efforts to prevent waste, fraud, and abuse of U.S. taxpayer money and Afghan taxpayer money uh, in that country. Secondly, I want to highlight the strong and well-informed leadership of the commander of the Resolute Support Mission, General John Nicholson, who while ably leading the soldiers of the NATO-led coalition, is also insisting on major reforms, including strong conditionality from the Afghan government. He knows that such reforms are necessary for the Afghan security forces to win 
and is also aware that the patience of the United States taxpayer is growing short for such reforms to be implemented. And in both regards, the general has vigorously conveyed those messages to the Afghan military and their leadership. Major General Richard Kaiser, who heads the Combined Security Transition Command Afghanistan, and his deputy, Major General Paul Ostrowski, also deserve credit for starting to enforce the conditions that we've ostensibly had in place for years to protect the money and material that we provide to the Afghans. It's a talented and qualified team which combined with the tireless work and institutional knowledge that Ambassador Michael McKinley provided over the last three and a half years has made a positive difference in the situation in Afghanistan over the last two years. Unfortunately, Ambassador McKinley left just before Christmas to take a new and well-deserved new posting. He will be sorely missed, and I can only hope that his permanent successor will bring as much expertise and continuity to the efforts as he did, particularly regarding his belief in real conditionality and in fighting corruption in Afghanistan. Now, that's the good news. There's negative news. Hey, I'm an IG. I can't have this talk about what we're finding. And what we're finding, we still have serious problems. The most basic challenge that bedevils Afghanistan today is the continued insecurity. And I only need, and I know all of you are following the press, the recent attacks that occurred in Afghanistan, serious attacks in the city, as well as within the last two days, there have been 56 security events, including in 22 of the 34 provinces. So the security situation is serious in Afghanistan. And for any country to function, whether it's Afghanistan or any other country, it needs to do at least two things, provide for the security of its people, and secondly, pay for that security and pay for the rest of the government. Right now, unfortunately, Afghanistan can do neither by itself. To combat the Taliban and other threats, the United States has provided more than $64 billion since 2002, including $3.45 billion in fiscal year 2016 alone to support the Afghan police and the military. The fighting season in Afghanistan has largely concluded for this year, although you can tell we still have security incidents, including the bombings yesterday in Kabul. But the year of survival, as President Ghani has called it, is over. What have been the results from 2016 fighting season? According to the Defense Department's latest report on operations in Afghanistan, the Afghan security forces are generally capable and effective at protecting major population centers, preventing the Taliban from maintaining prolonged control of specific areas, and of responding to Taliban attacks. And we know the Taliban made it clear that their goal for 2016 was to take over a provincial capital something they did not achieve despite several attempts. But let's think for a second of what I just said. We reportedly have a 320,000 man army in Afghanistan. What did it do last year? And what can it do? It's basically plain whack-a-mole following the Taliban around Afghanistan and retaking territory that was lost. The DOD report reiterates this point by noting that the vast majority of the Afghan National Army has little offensive capability. So the best spin the Afghan security forces can put on their activities in 2016 is that they were able to retake strategic areas that had temporarily been lost to the Taliban. So what we're doing is we're defining success by the absence of failure. At a minimum, they're playing defense and are not taking the fight to the Taliban. Now this is not for the lack of brave Afghans. 
More than 5,000 Afghan security personnel were killed in action the first eight months of 2016 alone. So what does this mean then for the next administration and the new Congress? My agency, along with many other observers of the situation, believe that the insidious combination of corruption and poor leadership is the root cause of this problem. For example, the New York Times recently reported that the Afghan security forces have over 1,000 generals. That's more than the entire US active duty military. Ironically, the Afghans don't have many colonels. Undoubtedly, some of these generals deserve the epaulets on their uniforms. But others bought their position, and others received them through ethnic or family patronage networks. Whatever the reason for their appointment, it does not make for an effective fighting force. General Nicholson's predecessor, General John Campbell, testified last February that leadership was the biggest challenge facing the Afghan National Security Forces. For example, when the Afghan 215 Corps and Helmand disintegrated in late 2015, the Resolute Support Mission oversaw an effort to oversaw, overhaul its leadership. The Corps' failure, which seemingly caught everyone by surprise, was in large part due to the number of non-existent or ghost soldiers on its payroll and the resultant overestimation of its uh, capabilities. In July of this year, General Nicholson indicated that all senior Afghan military leadership in Helmand had been replaced and that a new commander was in charge of the 215. However, just three months later, Resolute Support announced that the new and improved 215 Corps commander had himself just been replaced. Now this is not to blame our military. They're working with what they have, but it is troubling that the commander handpicked to clean up the security forces in Helmand had to be replaced so soon after his appointment. As the DOD report, again, cited, that I cited earlier states, quote, poor leadership and leader accountability, poor casualty and martyr care, lack of timely and accurate pay and inadequate living and working conditions all contribute to security force personnel leaving their assignments. When commanders act in that way, how can we be surprised when 75% of all personnel losses to the Afghan security forces are due to soldiers simply going AWOL? Poor leadership goes hand in hand also with the issue of corruption in Afghanistan. General John Allen, the former head of the International Security Assistance Forces, highlighted this problem when he testified before the Senate in 2014. He noted that corruption, not the Taliban, was the existential threat to Afghanistan. Reinforcing that point, his successor and the current chairman of the Joint Chiefs commissioned a study that determined, quote, corruption directly threatens the viability and legitimacy of the Afghan state, unquote. As SIGAR's 2016 Lessons Learned report on U.S. anti-corruption activities in Afghanistan confirmed, the U.S. contributed mightily to the problem by dumping too much money too fast into too small an economy with too little oversight. And we did so with too little understanding of the Afghan political and social realities which led us to making false assumptions about what was possible in the unrealistic time frames we tend to establish. We and the Afghans are now dealing with the consequences of that. Afghan commanders often pocket the paychecks of ghost soldiers for whom the U.S. is paying the salary. The number of ghost soldiers is not insignificant it likely reaches into the tens of thousands of soldiers and police. On my visit to Kabul over Christmas, I was encouraged to hear that as of this month, finally, Afghan security forces are being paid based on DOD-developed verification system known as ARIMS. That relies upon ID cards embedded with 
biometric information being registered daily to measure attendance. Historically, there has been at least a 15 to 20 percent difference between what, the, what has been self-reported by the Ministries of Defense and Interior versus the number of personnel actually registered in ARIMS. Now, SIGAR has been monitoring ARIMS deployment in recent years and has been very critical that it's taken so long to get deployed. It is well past time for its full implementation and to base U.S. funding on the numbers actually reported in the system rather than relying on the largely unverified and largely bogus numbers provided by the Afghan ministries. This is actually some good news, but corruption is still very troubling in Afghanistan. It is so bad that there is evidence that the Taliban have instructed their field commanders to simply purchase U.S. supplied weapons, fuel, and ammunition from the Afghan government because it is both easier and less expensive for the insurgents to do so. Now stop for a second. It's nice to know that the Taliban are now part of our supply chain. But what does that tell us about corruption and what does that tell us about the state of affairs in Afghanistan? Fuel purchases in particular by the Afghan security forces are a special area of significant corruption and mismanagement. Poor contract administration by the Afghan government has supplied, provided suppliers with many opportunities to substitute lower grade fuel for the Afghan security forces and to provide less fuel when ordered while selling the amount skimmed off the top on the open market tax-free. This and the widespread use of counterfeit customs exemption forms deprives the Afghan government of significant tax revenue. Again, on my last trip over Christmas to Afghanistan, officials with the Combined Security Transition Command Tamil told me that they finally had had enough and they were moving fuel back from off, on budget to be off budget, meaning we would do the purchasing of the fuel from henceforth. This would retake the control of the U.S. fuel procurement for Afghan security forces out of Afghan hands and ramp up the command's role in contract administration. Both actions which are well needed and may help in some of the thefts. But this still remains an area of particular concern, however, because even with these reforms, corruption goes way beyond the procurement. There are reports that when fuel finally reaches the front lines in Afghanistan, that some Afghan commanders refuse to use it, refuse to go on patrols, so they can save the fuel, which they then can sell on the open market. Why sell your 501k retirement plan? You know, so you're not, we are hearing credible information that Afghan commanders are not going on patrols, are not going to the assistance of their other Afghan units when they're in trouble because they don't want to use the fuel. It's better to sell it than to actually use it for why we purchased it. Multiple credible sources have told SIGAR staff in Afghanistan that a significant portion, perhaps as much as 50% of U.S. purchased fuel is siphoned off at various stages of this compromise system, wasting not only U.S. taxpayer dollars, but handicapping Afghan security forces and handicapping General Nicholson's position and his uh, efforts in Afghanistan. Now another security challenge that's directly related to the corruption issue, which is something that needs to be addressed, is that bleeding ulcer that is called drugs and narcotics. Resolute Support estimates that as much as 60 percent, that's 6 -0, of the Taliban's funding comes from poppy production, cultivation, and taxation. And of course, that uh, production is converted into opium for the streets of Europe and Russia. To date, the United States has spent roughly $8 billion to fight narcotics in Afghanistan. 
Unfortunately, we have little to show for that $8 billion. The coalition is not directly engaged in combating the poppy problem, despite, as I noted, the fact that poppy proceeds and taxes are a major source of Taliban funding. The most recent report of the United Nations Office of Drug and Crimes issued in October states that in a year's time, opium production in Afghanistan rose by 43%, and the amount of territory producing opium by 10%. So Afghanistan is continuing to grow poppy at a near record level. Compounding this problem, eradication efforts, which the United States has supported financially in the past, dropped by 91% from 2015 to 2016. Now policymakers should ask themselves, if we are worried about illicit oil sales funding ISIS terrorists in Syria and Iraq, why are we not as concerned about this key source of funding for the Taliban terrorists? Funding which is only serving to prolong America's longest war in Afghanistan. Now while the Taliban are raking in profits from the poppy trade and other illicit sources, the lack of financial sustainability of the Afghan government is another fundamental threat to the Afghan state, which we discuss in today's report. It, if it is not addressed, it will undermine all of our efforts to fight corruption and improve the security situation in Afghanistan. As I mentioned earlier, a government must be able to protect its citizens and it must be able to pay for the security and other basic needs. Afghanistan simply cannot afford to do so now and will not be able to do so in the near future. The US Defense Department estimates that Afghanistan will not be able to pay for even its security forces on its own until 2024. And most experts think that is overly optimistic. In addition, Afghanistan government Revenues only cover just over 50% of other government expenditures. Given the recent depreciation of the Afghan currency, the negative effect on the Afghan economy of the American and coalition withdrawal, and a demographic youth bulge that, as we saw last year, drove many Afghans to try to reach Europe as refugees, future prospects continue to look bleak. In the meantime, every American taxpayer in this room is helping to make up the difference to the tune of five to six billion dollars per year. Another area of our high risk report highlights, highlights is the challenge of protecting what we call on budget assistance to the Afghan government. On budget assistance, which includes government to government funding or direct assistance or money via international trust funds, are funds provided directly to and managed by the recipient government, in this case, the government of Afghanistan. The Obama administration pledged some time ago that eventually over 50% of all US assistance in Afghanistan would be provided on budget. Unfortunately, the ability of the Afghan ministries to manage such funds is long way from being adequate and given that Afghanistan is rated by Transparency International as the third most corrupt country on the planet, it appears to be a situation that all but encourages waste, fraud, and abuse. Should it therefore be any surprise that we continually hear about the palatial mansions of Afghan ministers and civil servants, as well as the specter of ghost teachers, doctors, soldiers, police, and even clinics and schools. And with every report, however, Afghan citizens lose more patience with their own government and the impunity of senior officials, tempting many of them to join or support the insurgency. Now the Defense Department is responsible for monitoring direct assistance money provided to the Afghan Ministry of Defense and Ministry of Interior, respectively, despite the fact that DOD places conditions on these funds as to how the Afghans are to spend and manage them, there are severe challenges to tracking that money once it's transferred to the Afghan government. Now, it's not just SIGAR that's been concerned for years about on-budget assistance. 
Just last month, the DODIG's office issued a report looking into the protections on, in place for on-budget assistance by DOD and found that, quote, U.S. direct assistance funding continues to be vulnerable to waste, fraud, and abuse. Now, on the positive side, to General Nicholson's credit, he is enforcing those conditions placed on the funds. And as I noted, he's retaking control of all fuel purchases paid for by the U.S., and he's implementing other measures to try to ensure the protection and good order in the funding uh, of the Afghan military. These kinds of steps should be encouraged by the new administration and Congress. And more importantly, they should be implemented with the same vigor by the other US government, US agencies operating in Afghanistan. As I said before, the United States and other donor nations contributed mightily to the explosion of corruption in Afghanistan. And as such, we have a responsibility to try to help the Afghans dig out of that problem. One recent positive step has been the establishment of the Anti-Corruption Justice Center, or ACJC. The Justice Center was launched with the full support of both President Ghani and CEO Abdullah with financial and technical backing from the UK and a few other donor participants. US support for the Justice Center to date has been limited to some financial and technical support provided by Resolute Support. The Justice Center is designed to handle high profile corruption cases and is supported by a group of vetted and mentored police, Afghan police, Afghan prosecutors and Afghan judges who along with their families are protected against political and physical dangers. Sounds very similar to the courts that we helped set up in Columbia when I was working on the Hill back in the 1980s to deal with drugs. To date, a few prosecutions have taken place. The first prosecution was of a general in the Afghan Attorney General's office who uh, was sentenced and convicted for taking a $750 bribe. Other government bodies, Afghan government bodies, including their parliament as well as Afghan civil organizations, want this justice center to go further, to directly attack the politically powerful and corrupt officials in Afghanistan, something that SIGAR fully supports. Our new administration and Congress should ask, is it finally time to stop talking about combating corruption and time for the Afghan government to start prosecuting senior officials who are either corrupt or feel they are above the law. Now, one good recent case just happened two days ago, uh, which is positive, was they finally arrested a very senior uh, interior official who was responsible for overseeing the purchase of fuel for taking a $150,000 bribe. He was tried and convicted and sentenced to 14 years imprisonment, and this happened just two days ago. So that's a very positive sign. But it can't just stop with the one general. It must continue. For only time will tell whether the Justice Center is a true and sustainable effort to root out corruption and not another Potemkin village just created to please and placate the donor community. We seriously hope this Justice Center will be successful, but we will continue to monitor it and we will continue to report publicly on its successes or failures. And where possible, we will provide assistance to the Afghan Ministry of Justice, to the Attorney General's office and their police to do something about corruption. SIGAR, for its part, is extremely encouraged by its successful cooperation over the last two years with President Ghani, his Attorney General's office, and others in the Afghan government. They leveraged our unique law enforcement presence we have the largest U.S. law enforcement presence in Afghanistan, but they have uh, worked with us uh, to help them fight crime, serious crime dealing with corruption. 
The close cooperation with President Ghani and his government has been one of the most positive changes from two years ago when we issued that first uh, high-risk list. For example, SIGAR unco uncovered a major fuel contract fraud about two years ago. It was a price-fixing case that led President Ghani to cancel the contract and save roughly $200 million in U.S. direct assistance. That's money that would have been wasted. SIGAR also undertook last summer a criminal investigation that uncovered another bid rigging scheme uh, on a $99 million road construction contract being issued by the Afghan government, but again funded with U.S. money, which was canceled after SIGAR presented its findings to President Ghani. We have also provided information that has assisted the Afghan Major Crimes Task Force to make a number of successful arrests of corrupt Afghan officials, including that recent case dealing with the general. It was based upon assistance provided by SIGAR. We are also the only U.S. oversight agency invited to sit in on the weekly meetings of the National Procurement Council, where senior Afghan officials, headed by President Ghani himself, personally review every major Afghan contract. And SIGAR is the only non-Afghan entity that has been officially granted via a presidential decree by President Ghani himself to ex access all Afghan records related to the Kabul bank fiasco so that we may try to make recoveries and prosecutions. That said, more can and should be done to give not only us, but the, our other U.S. partners and the Afghans needed tools to protect U.S. and coalition taxpayer dollars. Unfortunately, in the nearly five years, it's hard to believe it's nearly five years that I've been doing this, I have witnessed over those five years the United States put in way too much way too fast in Afghanistan. And then for the last two years, I've watched the U.S. remove way too much, way too fast. Policymakers both in Congress and the new Trump administration should take note of that. Fortunately, General Nicholson and his team are attempting to address some of those capability gaps that have emerged as the U.S. scaled back especially in the areas of fighting corruption. One action that would help would be to reestablish the Afghan threat finance cell, whose mission was to identify, intercept, and disrupt any funding that supported the Taliban. SIGAR's anti-corruption lessons learned report, which we released a couple months ago, found that the threat finance cell effectively uncovered connections between corrupt Afghan officials criminal elements, drug traffickers, and insurgents. Unfortunately, as our military forces withdrew and U.S. law enforcement uh, agencies significantly scaled back their presence in Afghanistan, pursuant to a State Department-directed effort to quote-unquote right-size and quote-unquote normalize the embassy and U.S. presence, the threat finance cell was, cell, was, cell was shuttered. We believe that was a mistake. And we are encouraged by General Nicholson's efforts to try and rebuild some of the mission's past capacities in those areas and hope that the new administration and Congress will, re, will support such efforts and conduct a thorough assessment of resources and personnel to ensure they are sufficient to meet our military law enforcement, and civilian objectives in Afghanistan. I think Dr. Cordesman, in his report, which I highly recommend you read, it was released, I think, January 5th, calls for a similar zero-based net assessment on both the military and civilian side, and we agree with such an assessment. Now, in conclusion, with a new president and cabinet assuming office, we cannot be sure what direction Afghanistan policy will go. Incoming officials no doubt realize, as does the current administration, 
that the choices are not easy ones and the outcomes are not guaranteed. Withdraw and the democratic government of Afghanistan may well fall. Stay and continue what we have been doing with the current resources and we may be faced with what General Dunford has called, and others, a stalemate. Or we can develop, along with our Afghan and coalition allies, and I repeat that, along with our Afghan and coalition allies, because the complaints we have heard in the past is the Afghans are usually told about these programs and policies after they've already been decided. Let's bring them in early. That'd be, that'd be a novel approach. Let's bring in our allies early. That would even be a more novel approach. And if we do, we may be able to develop a new and better strategy that builds upon our successes and avoids many of the failures that SIGAR, the GAO, the other oversight agencies, the Department of Defense itself have identified, and as Dr. Cordesman has identified in his report, as well as his colleagues here at CSIS over the last few years. These are some of the policy options that must be considered by the new Trump administration and the Congress. But whatever they decide to do, it is likely to take many more years and it will cost significant amounts of money. And it will need to be done better and there needs to be oversight. Transparency and oversight has to be made mission critical. Just as robust oversight of federal expenditures is critical here in the United States, whether it's purchasing another Air Force One for the president or a new fighter aircraft, aggressive and transparent oversight must be mission critical for reconstruction programs in Afghanistan to succeed. Fifteen years in, there is no reason we should be seeing the problems we continue to witness and document in the nearly 250 reports my little office has released. My hope, and the hope of my staff, is that the high-risk report we are issuing today and the examples it provides will help guide Congress and the Trump administration as we move into 2017 to ensure a strong, better, and more effective reconstruction effort in what has become America's longest war. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. I think that, let me make one thing absolutely clear. There has been no collusion between my report and SIGAR but when you deal with things you can measure, you tend to reach a fairly wide area of agreement. And I would like to just reinforce some of the points John made, and at the same time raise some issues. One is, and I have put the graphs and data in the report, I was going to show them briefly, but we naturally improved our computer system by breaking it. <laughs> So we can't really display it. We have the same system, I think. Yes, I think most people do. Uh, but quite seriously, first, we have very little real reporting on the course of the war that shows what's happening in given districts, provinces, and how what is a battle for hearts and minds is developing. But when you compare the limited reporting that the Department of Defense makes public, it is far more optimistic than the reporting that comes out of the United Nations, and it is far more optimistic than the reporting that comes out of polling of Afghans by province. We are spinning the war in many ways publicly in ways which I think all of you who follow this in the press realize are not realistic. And that is shown by a steady expansion of the casualties and the risks 
in parts of Afghanistan that were not at risk before we withdrew at the end of 2014. In a very good poll by the Asian Foundation, when Afghans were asked how many of them feared for the future and their personal safety, you went from 48% in 2012 to 70% at close to the end of this year. When you looked at confidence in the Afghan army, it's dropped on an average by 10% or more in the last year in areas like honest and fair, helps improve security, and protects civilians. The Afghan police is far more negative. Only about a third of the Afghans feel the ANP is effective in dealing with crime. And polls show that most Afghans do not rely on the formal rule of law to resolve disputes or to deal with criminal activity. They also tend to show that the Afghan police is relatively corrupt. The good news is that there is less and less support for the Taliban. The bad news is that in 2014, at the beginning of the year that we transitioned out, something like 37 percent of the population felt that Afghanistan was going in the wrong direction. In the fall of this year, it was 66 percent. That's a doubling in the course of two years. And you do not win if you do not have public support. The reasons were insecurity, as John mentioned, unemployment, corruption, bad government, and a bad economy. One of the areas that you did not highlight as an area of concern, John, but I think is critical, is the quality of governance regardless of corruption. Some of you are familiar with the World Bank's ratings of governance. They don't deal with human rights and democracy. They deal with the basic functions of does a government work. Afghanistan is rated as one of the worst overall governments in the world. It is not typical of developing countries. And it has not improved as a result of US aid or outside aid over time. And that is a critical problem. A lot of it is that the government in Kabulstan often has some very competent people. When you cross the borders of Kabulstan into other areas, you come into areas of conflict, power brokers, warlords, ethnic and sectarian tension. And unfortunately, one key measure of effectiveness is how rapidly the central government can spend the money. And there is virtually no other measure of effectiveness. I think John and Sigar have pointed out that we have all kinds of claims about education, health, extended life expectancy, which frankly do not track with any outside independent audit or observer. You find, too, that satisfaction with government is not only low, but corruption is a constant. Why? Because if corruption is seen as a critical problem, by 75% of the population, it's really hard to increase. Now, let me raise John, because I have the privilege of dealing with the US side and not simply the Afghan side. Uh, and I was with, as I think a number of you realize, the civilian advisory team to General McChrystal and basically since about 2002, was involved on the security and aid side. 
One thing that many people do not realize when you talk about the Afghan forces, and in my report there are three pages of direct quotes from the DOD report of the problems in those forces. We never were serious until about 2011. The resources in terms of trainers and money take time to appear. It was 2012 before we had real training teams in place with qualified personnel. And reporting by General Caldwell makes this very clear, as do the numbers in those graphs in Cigar. You look at their reports, when you have a mountain range of funding, remember if you don't pay, you're not doing it. And we had a minor problem called Iraq, and by and large we didn't pay. The end result is today we have an Afghan force which, as John points out, is not ready. But there's another side to this. Without being able to cite the people involved, the estimate of the minimal train and assist mission that we would need before the transition in 2014 that was recommended was about 18,000 military. The number that was actually authorized was a little over 15,000. The number that should be there and is reported is somewhat over 13,000. That's US and allied. The number that's really there is closer to 12. And that's because of the leave and rotation cycles. John touched on this, but one way to lose is to have an annual rotation cycle. Another is to have a rotation cycle where people have six weeks to two months leave in terms of the course of the year of service. And another is to have 60 countries trying to coordinate in doing something effective. The other problem you get into here is when we talk about assistance, we do not have the capability to provide advisory teams even at the core level. The major combat units are called CANDEX. With very limited exceptions, we do not have train and assist personnel there. The entire history of the lessons of war is if you do not have people in the system, as John pointed out, fuel, reinforcements, ammunition, do not move forward. You do not identify competent combat leaders. You can't support people and really help them deal with technical issues and create mature units. And we do have a case in point because Having decided not to do it in Afghanistan and not do it in Iraq, we had to do it in Iraq to get to the campaign in Mosul. And just about two weeks ago, the administration reversed itself and sent in train and assist teams to not only assist at the combat level, but to be blunt, be boots on the ground and support combat operations. I think this is critical, and it has been compounded by yet another element. You didn't touch on the air component, but the fact is, even when that's ready, and if you look through the reporting on it, you can't find a single report on sortie rates, mission capability, or what the Afghan Air Force does, in a case like Iraq, we are flying 20 times as many sorties in support of a much more capable and better equipped and experienced military force 
as AFCENT reports we are doing in Afghanistan. So one of the key questions here, and I'm raising this personally, for the next administration is are you going to have an advisory and support effort tailored to the need or are you yet again going to have one which is arbitrarily sized in capability and manning regardless of the requirement and are you going to carry out the current plan which will reduce 12,000 to less than 11,000. A second dimension, and I think this is one John touched upon, but you have not mentioned the economy. In the report that I have put together, and I'm not an economist, I'm not sure whether that's praise or an indictment. <laughs> I do, however, quote the World Bank <coughs> and the IMF. You have a crisis. It's very well described in both the World Bank and IMF reporting. And if you're seriously interested, I would urge you to read it. And it has nothing to do with development. One of the most striking aspects of the World Bank team in Afghanistan is to find that as aid massively increased from 2008 on, it had no impact at all on poverty, malnutrition, urban slums, and migration out of rural areas. And since 2014, with the cuts in military spending and contracting, you have seen a major increase in a country that has large-scale endemic malnutrition, a large outflow from rural areas, urbanization under slum and marginal employment conditions. And I will make this statement, and John, you can contradict me, that in spite of having an integrated civil-military plan, in theory, any of you who read what passes for that plan and have any familiarity with PowerPoint will recognize when the plan is all geometry, shapes, arrows, and interesting, but absolutely unintelligible symbols, you have no plan. Not only that, you have dropped all State Department and US aid reporting on the civil side and governance side out of the semi-annual report from the Department of Defense. You have never had a meaningful report on effectiveness of the aid effort in governance, rule of law, or the economic side issued by either state or USAID having had to audit some of those reports in an official capacity, let me say that public relations is not a plan. <laughs> it is important, but it isn't a plan. So this is a crisis. And John, I don't know if you want to comment before we open up. I'm not going to put you on the spot. No, 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 no. I, 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 I really do want to uh, comment because I, I think, uh, Tony, once again, I think you, you're, you're hitting uh, all the high points of not only your own work, but obviously our work. Uh, and remember, our, our high risk list, um, you know, touches on key issues, but there's a lot behind it. So like the economy, we've done tons of reports on the economy and we've uh, indicated that we really don't have a strategy. I remember being shocked. Well, I take it back. I don't get shocked much anymore in Afghanistan. Um, but surprise, let's just say, or uh, being briefed by the embassy and the State Department and aid on what their economic strategy was. This is a couple of years ago, and it was a uh, developing a value-added tax. I thought to myself, oh, 
So the big issue for developing the economy in Afghanistan is to develop a VAT. Well, you've got to have some value to tax, okay? I mean, it was just an absurd thing, and it's like many of the ideas we've seen. They really look great on paper, and they make some sense here in northern Virginia or Washington, D.C., but are totally, uh, you know, cut off from the reality in Afghanistan. They don't produce anything, uh, except drugs. Uh, we can't tax that. So I agree with you, Tony. I mean, you know, we really need to focus on the economy and not a tax. You got to have something to tax. Uh, the latest briefings we got were that we're going to increase revenue uh, at the borders, which is a noble objective. But you've got to have exports and imports to tax at the borders. If you don't, you can have the greatest systems in the world, but they're not collecting anything. And of course, there's the corruption issue, which is something else. Um, I could not find a strategic document now, maybe there was one out there. People do have a tendency of hiding documents from our, the IGs on any planning for what was the impact going to be on the Afghan economy when we pulled out 100,000 troops. It does have an impact. I mean, most of the GDP is, was being provided by the coalition forces. You would think somebody would have had a strategy, okay, what is this impact going to be on the Ghani government when all those people leave? Not from a security point of view, just from an economic point of view. And there wasn't one. Um, I agree wholeheartedly with you on um, not winning this on a press release. We have had too many, uh, we call them in my office, the kites and balloons. We got little pictures of kites and balloons. And everything is hunky-dory in Afghanistan. The reality of the situation is it's not. Uh, and, you know, self-delusion is the mortal enemy of any national decision-making. And I'm hoping the next Congress and the next president realizes that. Don't believe your press releases. Remember who wrote them. Uh, and that's, I, even in, a, in CIGAR, I know that. I, I know who writes them, so we got to be careful about it. Don't believe what you write. Uh, we really do need to focus on it. So the economy is really important. Um, civil military, we're still waiting for the strategy. We're still waiting for a strategy on narcotics. We're still waiting for a strategy on the economy. We're still waiting for a strategy on corruption. We haven't gotten one. And why is strategy important? Because with strategy, you design, decide, you design programs. Up to now, the program is, we got an appropriation, let's spend it. But when you have a strategy, you have programs that kind of, that they support the strategy. And then you can ask for, do you have metrics for success? That's another thing we don't find. And, and Tony, you and I have had this conversation before. Four years ago, I sent a letter to the SecDef, Sec State, and head of USAID saying, can you tell me, give me a 10 most successful programs in Afghanistan? I'm still waiting for the answer. I then wrote a second letter saying, hold it, maybe that was too difficult. Don't give me 10, just give me some. Still waiting for an answer. The answer I got was from USAID, well, that's like asking a parent which of his children is better or not. How can you, you know, rack and stack your children? They're all wonderful. Well, my response was, I didn't think USAID and development was the Sophie's choice of issues facing us. I mean, if you can't rack and stack your programs based upon success, what happens when you start cutting the budget back? You don't know which one is succeeding and which one is failing. Which one should you keep or which one should you get rid of? And I think what you're saying, Tony, with the zero-based analysis you're talking about is what I'm talking about racking and stacking also. 
We, I hope that the new Congress and I hope the new administration will ask their agencies to rack and stack what is working and which is working the best in certain areas. And we haven't seen that type of rigor. Now, I used to be a partner in a law firm and I represented a lot of Fortune 100, Fortune 500 firms. And I, I remember having one client who used to sell food, you know, uh, popular food around the country. They knew how many pickles were being sold in any given city in the United States at any time. Now, I'm not saying we need that type of rigor in the United States government when we do development, but we gotta have some concept of the reality. And I'll give you a classic example. I met with a very prominent and senior Afghan woman uh, a couple months ago and talked about programs to assist the Afghan women. And she said, Mr. Sapko, nobody talks to us. And the proof for that is this program, which your administration has said is the largest program to help women in the history of USAID, and it's gonna help more women in Afghanistan than any other program. And it's gonna help poor women and rich women, educated women and uneducated women is a fraud. Why? Because the prerequisite to be helped, and remember, we said it was gonna help every woman in Afghanistan, even out to the furthest province. But the prerequisite that was written in the program to get aid on this program or get accepted was you had to have a high school degree. Anyone who works in Afghanistan realizes by requiring a high school degree, you've just eliminated 95% of the Afghan women. So she said, I rest my case, Mr. Sopko. That is what we are faced with. People don't know where they're going. It worked in Iraq, or it worked in the Congo, or it worked in Colombia. It sure, it'll work in Afghanistan. It doesn't. You gotta know the issue, you gotta know it, and that's why I say it really would be unique if you talk to the Afghans before you design a program. Uh, we actually uh, asked Congress to, <laughs> it was so simple, but it, we just asked Congress to mandate that. Uh, and I think they did in one area, I think it was in one of the authorization or appropriations bills. But, so I think you raised tremendous points. The one point we didn't touch on directly is the annual lobotomy. Every year, we shoot ourselves in the head. We move out all of our senior people who have been doing great things. Now, I, I'm probably disliked by enough people who work in the government, now I'm gonna be disliked by their spouses. But I think we gotta address this issue of the rotation. You talk about a rotation. Some of the rotations are even shorter than a year, eight months. Some agencies just send people for two months. They don't even know where the defect is in two months. And the Afghan city on the other side who is maybe trying to game the system just waits for the next person to show up because this guy's gonna be gone in six months. Uh, we've got to handle that. And that's a situation I think has been a problem in the United States, not only on the military side, but in the uh, civilian sector for years and in other areas. Um, I'm not saying everybody has to stay for the duration like World War II, but if you're a senior official, you ought to stick around to see if your program works or fails, other than declaring a success and leaving for the next guy. So Thank I don't you. know if that answers some, but I've touched on some of the points. So. Thanks very much, yeah. John. We have some time for questions. Let me make a couple of obvious points. Look around, you can see how many people are in the room. Uh, a question should be short and coherent and one question per person. I don't want to have to cut you off, but we have an excellent set of steps outside if you want to give a speech. <laughs> this is not the place to do it. And with that, I'm going to just sort of call on people and since I don't know everyone in the room, I'm going to have to do it by geography. Uh, we do have mics and please do identify yourself as well as ask the question. The lady in the second row. 
I'm Dr. Marianne Cusimano Love from Catholic University. Given the comments you've both just made about failure to uh, coordinate with civil society in Afghanistan, I wonder of your seven questions that you ask before a project should be done, uh, one, your question number three is, has the project been coordinated with other U.S. agencies, with the host government, other international donors? Why aren't you integrating coordination with civil society or with women into your, your questions that you're asking prior to uh, authorization of project money? It, that's a good question. I mean, those questions were basically directed to U.S. government agencies and policymakers before they design a program and before they implement it. But I would hope that for uh, NGOs and the rest of them, they do the same thing. I think some, uh, actually, we got that idea from talking to some of the NGOs. Uh, no. Well, let oh, me, I, yeah, let me yeah, just sure. comment on this. You're making assumptions about the structure of Afghan society, and particularly the way the Afghan government works, that simply don't apply in this country. The Afghan government basically can't do a particularly good job of coordinating within a given ministry. Civil society and civil institutions, unfortunately, tend very often to be centered around a narrow minority of educated people. As John pointed out, is isn't just women, it's men. There is the cobblestone problem. And the minute you get out of cobblestone, you end up having to deal with ethnic, sectarian, and regional problems, which divide up the country in very narrow, tribal, clan, and power broker ways. So one of the problems you have here is to try to figure out how you can work around the lack of all of those structures. To be perfectly honest, too, for all the problems in government, having worked rather extensively with NGOs and indeed some governments, Far too many of them do their own thing, regardless of whether it's needed or even does harm. Schools get built, wells get drilled. Lots of things happen because that's what this element does. In civil society, when you can set up in a forward operating base and watch villages shooting at each other over some water or other claim, doesn't quite work out the same. These are problems that you have to work around as best you can. But as John pointed out, what you can do in some countries, you simply can't do in others. Next question. Uh, the gentleman, I think, in the front row is. No. Don't be uh, bashful. Again, Ken, who are you before you ask? Ken Meyer, Gord, uh, World Docs. Uh, when we could take a flaxen-headed plowboy from Kansas who's never fired a gun and turn him into an effective soldier uh, willing to risk his life in a far-off la far land in a matter of a few months, yet after 15 years we haven't been able to develop a, an effective fighting force in a country that's been at war for over 30 years and uh, who are ostensibly fighting for their own country. Doesn't this suggest that the real problem is not training or resources but morale and isn't the morale problem uh, at the heart of the corruption problem. Let me, I, I think it's partially morale, and I think that's why we focus on the corruption. I think, uh, and we talk about the leadership too, because uh, the report that I think you cite from the Department of Defense and that we, I cited also is talking about that you're not getting basic services to that Afghan soldier. Uh, and that's talking about pay, food, equipment, and leadership. So it is a b big morale issue. Uh, but the corruption is part of the problem that you're not getting the fuel or you're not getting the food or you're not getting your equipment because your, your officer is selling it uh, in the black market. Um, but I want to go back to another thing which I also think deals with training and, and, and uh, Tony, you, you, you touched on and I want to emphasize this. 
Our train, advise, and assist program, and I, I know some of you have military backgrounds and DOD backgrounds. You understand what a CANDAC is or what a core is. But right now, we have limited people at the core level. We have no visibility except on special forces do. And, and training the Afghan special forces, we actually have people down with the fighting units. But we have no visibility below the core. So that also goes to morale, and that also goes to the training. And then until, and I'm, I can't tell you what number, I leave that to the generals and the policymakers, what number of advisors we should have. Just realize that that is a limitation. And I don't know, from Vietnam era, having our people, our advisors down actually with the fighting units, I don't know if any studies were ever done about how that improved or didn't improve morale. Uh, but. But I've been told by enough people that we just don't have any visibility at those lower levels. So that's why we don't know how many people show up for roll call, what type of equipment they have, are they being fed, are they getting martyr benefits, their family's martyr benefits, are they allowed to go home? Some of these people fight for a year on and can never get home. Um, so. Tony, I don't know if you want to add to no. your, based upon your experience. About I morale. think that first, we learned the hard way in Vietnam, and I don't want to get into the politics of this, but it's a critical issue. We basically pulled out the forward advisor structures. What we watched was that this was an unready army too, partly because of morale, but mostly because of politics, corruption, and internal rivalries. And if you read the U.S. Army's official history of what happened to the Arvin, you had a massive desertion rate. Good units tended to fall apart because officers rotated out. The good units that were left suddenly found themselves in a position where they couldn't trust the units near them to provide fire support or hold. But in the case of Afghanistan, what people have is the strange impression. We had this systematic plan to build an effective force. There are a number of ambassadors and generals who can tell you you never had a chance. Because of Iraq, we wouldn't resource it. And we never had a stable goal or a real plan to build an Afghan force until we decided we were going to leave to a deadline at the end of 2014. Look at the budget. You resourced it in fiscal 2011 and 2012. Takes you months to over a year to deliver the money. Look at General Caldwell's report on the number of actual people trained to be trainers and advisors. Most of the people assigned had no background. And once the Afghan le unit left the training center, there was no follow-up. And then all of a sudden, you were out at the end of 2014, and you expected this force to fight. And of course, it didn't work. You know, follow the money is one of the most classic cases in public administration, military or civil. What do we have in common in Iraq and Afghanistan? There's no way to follow the money. Once you spend it, unless you have a special inspector general, it's gone invisibly. And you could look at things like the McMaster's report to realize how badly we track contractors at every level. Let's see. Uh, I want to get a question in back, the gentleman back there. Oh, thank you very much. Um, I, I'm, my name is Dr. Charles Oliver. I'm, I'm with USAID, actually. And um, I was in Afghanistan from 09 to 15. Um, in fact, I remember accompanying uh, Mr. Soko on his trip. I think it was 2014 was to it Helmand. Was it the, where was it? Uh? I think it was in 14. We were with, with Ambassador Alford. I was the USAID rep. And we went to Helmand to uh, Leatherneck. Oh, yeah. OK. Yeah. So um, I really appreciate all the things you said about, particularly about the, the, uh, the military. I think you really were right on as far as um, the leadership issue. And 
I really hope that they'll, that that advice will be heeded. One one phenomenon I witnessed during this this long period of stretch of time, um, toward the end especially, was that um, we were faced with an extremely challenging task in Kabul, where I hardly ever was, um, which was this phenomenon of all of our local staff being awarded special immigration visas. Now I'm a humanitarian, and I certainly you know. Uh, respected the work these people did, and some of them risked their lives every day just to show up to work. But the phenomenon was such that it became practically impossible for us to retain Afghan staff. Most of the staff that we had there probably two years ago are now living in the United States. Uh, even beyond that, it, even the, the contractors um, were apparently eligible to, to get immig immigration visas. I was told the person who puts the scoop of ice cream on the cone in the DFAC was also eligible to get this. And so as a result of this, we were having to do things like get third country nationals and all kinds of really challenging ways to try to uh, get people to help still monitor our activities because it became increasingly challenging for us um, Americans to even get outside of the, of the, the fortress of the embassy. So, what advice would you give to the incoming administration about ch dealing with that challenge, if you have any? Yeah, uh, that is one issue that uh, we haven't looked at because it's not directly related to reconstruction. But I, I think you you touch on an issue of, uh, I, I think a bigger issue, and that is how do we do our work in this type of environment where there's people trying to kill us. And you have to rely upon your Afghan colleagues. And if the Afghan colleagues keep disappearing on visas, and I, I, I can't really speak to that because I know many Afghans, and we've actually hired them and we've lost them, and we've, sometimes we rehire them back in the, here in the United States. They really deserve, and that program is a deserving program because uh, these people are risking their lives and they risk their lives for us. And I, you know, I, I can't. Uh, uh, attack that program because I think it's a worthwhile program. But we do have a problem with staffing. And uh, on the one hand, I'm complaining about some of our senior people just leave so suddenly. We rotate so quickly. You are an exception to stay that long. And I'm glad to see that. There are people who stay for four or five years who you, you can appreciate more than anybody you developed a historical understanding. You knew the country and you knew the people you were dealing with. Um, to me, that's, a, that's something we got to capture. And I don't know how you do that. Now, we're going to issue a lessons learned report that's starting to be developed right now on this whole issue of personnel. In a situation like this, how do you address the rotation system, the award system, and all of that. How do you get the right person to stay the right amount of time uh, in an environment that is not Norway? I mean, this is not Kansas. The, you're getting shot at. I mean, I got the data on the, the number of attacks right now. And I think uh, the, the poor UAE delegation, I think they lost mm -hmm. seven or 10 people, including their ambassador, in that provincial governor's office and I don't know if you were on that trip, but I was in that office. I remember what it took to get there. And I think a week after I was there, one of your colleagues was stuck when there was an attack. So I missed it by a week. Um, this is what people like he did every day. And you know, we do tend to focus on the soldiers who lose their lives, who are injured, who have to live in hellish conditions. But, you know, living in this medium security prison they call the embassy in Kabul is also a, a hellish situation, separated from friends and family. Uh, and when you're out in the field like he was, it's a pretty miserable, scary situation. But people are doing it, so let's not lose track on it. But I, I, I'm getting off point because I'm, I'm so glad to see you again, and I'm glad you got out alive. Uh, there are, let's not forget the, the diplomats, the aid workers, and the contractors. And, and you and I had a conversation before about how many contractors are there, but you know, a lot of contractors, whether they're US or third party nationals, are taking the brunt of security issues and other issues there, and we can't forget them. 
They're an important part of the team. Let's see. Uh, I'm going to try to move it around the room. The lady with the, in this third row there. Uh, Marina Ottawa with the Wilson Center. Given the enormity of the problems you have described, the security problems, governance problems, lack of uh, revenue, lack of resources in general on the Afghan side, lack of strategic plan on the part of the United States, what's uh, the best that you, the next administration could hope to accomplish in the next few years? Because my first impression is this is a hopeless situation. I think that you have to be careful. What you can't accomplish is development. What you can probably do on the civil side is make the impact of the withdrawal and the cutbacks in spending acceptable, or at least tolerable, to a reasonable amount of the population. On the military side, the fortunate aspect of this is, for all of the defects in the Afghan National Security Forces, you're not dealing with a brilliant, highly capable enemy or a popular one. But the fact is that you need to both do more from the outside and you need to insist. John pointed this out on conditionality and performance. One way to lose decisively is to not demand that Afghans actually perform, use counter-corruption, the power of the purse, public exposure of incompetent or corrupt officials, none of which meets the standards of polite diplomacy and there is a whole structure in the aid community that believes you should never attempt to impose. But if you don't impose, you lose. Now, how far can you go? I remember another gentleman from aid pointing out to me that he would really be happy if in a decade Afghanistan could meet the standards of Bangladesh. And I thought he was kidding. <coughs> So I went to the UN reports on human development and realized he was absolutely right. Afghanistan in the real world is at that level. You're not going to have quick development. Fantasies about minerals, silk roads, all the rest. This is just plain rubbish. You deal with the country as it is. You help it as it is. And where it goes in the long run is beyond your control or outside influence. I, I, I think Tony summarizes it quite well. I would only add this. Um, we can accomplish a lot if we listen to the reports we've put out and other very thoughtful people like CSIs. We can improve the rule of law. We can improve the governance. Remember. We don't have to turn this into Norway. We just need the government to function in a way that the Afghan people are happy or happier with it and therefore will support them and not support the insurgency. Right now, because of the impunity of many of the corrupt officials and warlords, in the eyes of the Afghan government, the government is not legitimate. And as long as it's not legitimate, you're going to have problems with morale on your troops. You're going to have problems with supporting the government and people supporting the insurgency. John, we have officially reached the end of the meeting. If oh, you dear. can stay. Oh, I'm happy to stay. I, uh, uh, ladies yeah. and gentlemen, uh, this is not a university class, but you are free to leave. Uh, but you, <laughs> you will get course credit in <laughs> yeah. Afghan 101, right? Yeah. J just take an examination as you leave. Uh, <laughs> seriously, uh, let me ask if some of you do want to add questions. Uh, let's see, I'm trying to look at the people who'd asked earlier. Let me ask the young lady over there.
Hi, I'm Katie Putz with The Diplomat, and my question's pretty simple. Given that there's a change of administration in like a week, uh, what are your expectations for the incoming administration during the campaign and since Donald Trump hasn't said terribly much about Afghanistan, so I realize it's grasping at straws, but what does this mean for SIGUR in the work that you do? Thank you. Well, look at it. Afghanistan was not a big topic of conversation during the campaign, but it also wasn't a big topic of conversation in the prior two campaigns. Um, I don't know why, it's beyond my, my, my fathom, uh, but I'm kind of myopic. I live, eat, and breathe on organized crime, corruption in Afghanistan for the last five years, so in my view, it should be the most important thing. I, I don't know. I just have the, f I'm, I'm always optimistic. And that's just my personality. Despite of the fact I'm always talking about negative things, I just realize that all of these screw ups are man made or human made. We can fix them. So uh, I'm, I'm assuming uh, that the government will, f our new government will focus on the issues. And uh, I'm, eternally hopeful that uh, we can improve the situation in Afghanistan. Uh, and we are here to support the president and the administration and Congress. Uh, I serve the president of the United States, whoever he may be, and uh, intend to serve uh, the American taxpayer and the, uh, the new administration. And my agency is uh, in existence until the amount of reconstruction aid by statute. We turn into a pumpkin and disappear when the amount of authorized, appropriated, but not yet spent reconstruction funds fall below 250 million. Then we go out of existence, I think, 180 days afterwards. Um, right now we got seven or more billion dollars authorized, appropriated, or not yet spent. So we could be around for a long time. Um, and based upon the promises we made and based upon the situation in Afghanistan, I think, uh, you know, we need to be there and support it. It still has an important national security goal uh, for uh, our country. Yeah. Oh, he's saying wrap up or? or? All right. I think we're, they're threatening to throw us out of the room. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you what, one last question. Uh, the gentleman in the third row there. Thank you. I'm Faridun, I'm a contractor of the State Department. My question concerns the application of rule of law. Um, so I worked in Afghanistan in 2006 with the United Nations and now I call it a forgotten uh, program where we had the transitional justice. And that didn't happen because of the compromises of some of the high ranking officials in the government have troubling background and in, that includes people that are now in the parliament and they are the lawmakers of the country. Okay. My question is, the new administration, what would be feasible approach to bring into justice people like you mentioned before that are high ranking government officials that commit crime, whether it's human rights crimes, corruption crimes or war crimes. Uh, what the new administration will actually be able to do to support Afghan government to bring those people into justice. Okay, Thank let you. me quickly answer. I think the key difference between now and two years ago is we got a government that is a willing partner to address the situation. And why is it a willing partner? I, I think they, f they fully believe that they got to stop this impunity and corruption. Let's, on historically, I dealt with the drug problem and Bolivia and Colombia, in particular Colombia. Uh, it wasn't until the government viewed drug trafficking as an existential threat to the existence of the Colombian Republic did the Colombian government take drug trafficking seriously. And that is the same thing in Afghanistan. You're not going to address the impunity, you're not going to address the corruption issue, you're not going to address the drug issue there until the government and that's all of the government, views those threats as existential threats. 
I think, in my humble opinion, I haven't done an audit, but I meet with President Ghani and I meet with Abdullah and I meet with their, ser their senior advisors, I think they view those problems as existential threats. Now, can they convince some of those corrupt parliamentarians and those corrupt generals and corrupt warlords? I don't know. It's going to be tough. Our job is to help them. Now that we have willing partners, to help them. And that's why this ACJC, this, this new court, is a step. It's a little step, but it's a step in the right direction. So. I would just add to that. You have to be careful about the question. One problem with the way the justice system works in Afghanistan today is essentially it's reverted to a mixture of traditional justice, non-justice, people resolve it by political influence or force, or they turn to the Taliban, which provides quick and somewhat preemptory justice. When you're fighting at the local level, down to the district or the local level, you can't solve the problem at the top official level. And public opinion polls in Afghanistan by province and region show that people are even more concerned about problems with local corruption than they are with anything that happens in Kabul, for a very good reason. Very few people actually deal with anyone in Kabul. And the honest answer is you can control the money to some degree. You can try to use techniques like lawyer jerkas or local assemblies. You can provide transparency and force that so you get public opinion. But frankly, you're not going to have reform at the rule of law level in many of these areas because you don't have the stability, you don't have the security, you don't have the lawyers, you don't have the judges, you don't have the jails, which are all minor ingredients in making the system work. And it is a really critical issue. Ladies and gentlemen, let me thank John for providing real thank substance, you. and thank you very much for coming. But let's thank John in the usual way.